Welcome to the Mischief. I'm Valen, and this is Vintage Story. Today I'm going to be teaching you just about everything there is to do about farming and flax. So you'd think that you would just make a hoe, start tilling some dirt, putting some water nearby, all sorts of stuff. Well, before you do any of that, you're going to want to make sure that you carefully choose the area that you want to actually farm. The reason I bring this up is because if you have oceans in your world or you're near an extremely large source of water, you might want to consider that your crops might be touching salt water and therefore most of which will die. So you'll want to be very careful. If you've turned on your world map, this is going to make things a lot easier. Otherwise, it's going to be a little bit more challenging. Two ways that I am currently aware of that you can easily identify salt water from fresh water is that the dark area here on the sides is salt water and this lighter area is going to be fresh water. That's the, one of the easiest ways to do it, and it doesn't require any materials. The second of which is to get yourself a bucket, bucket the, up some water nearby, and see if it says that it's salt water or not. But that does require you to have progressed through metallurgy, and we're not at that point, at least at the beginnings of this episode. So once you've picked your spot, you may want to fill in some space and create a little bit of a gap and some protections from different pests. There are certain types of dirt you're going to want to be looking out for in the world. If you find any of this extremely dark stuff hidden in between or underneath some of the edges of these little hills called terra preta, you're going to want to dig that up. This is some of the best soil that you could get in the game. And you can also enhance this further later on with fertilizers. But there is a variety of different kinds of stuff here that you're going to want to be aware of. If you're in a drier area or very warm landscape, you're probably going to find something like this barren soil, which is not going to have very good nutrients and stuff in it. Then there's low fertility soil, which is probably the most common. And the next most common from that is going to be medium fertility, which if you're fortunate, you'll come across some in your travels, most likely in a forest or a nice uh, area that, that just has a decent amount of vegetation. You might find some around. You might have to do a little bit of digging because there's also forest floors out there that can be deceiving as to what is underneath it until you've dug. Now, of course, there's also high fertility, but usually that is crafted by you with different composting techniques or because of your fertilizing. But all that aside, you're going to want to keep an eye on things around it when you first set up your farm. If you have your farm just out in the open like this, you're going to be attacked relentlessly by the local rodents. In other words, rabbits are going to come and they're going to eat all of your vegetables, potentially just leaving some seeds if you're fortunate. Uh, otherwise, you and your berries might also be attacked by raccoons what I fondly refer to them as trash pandas. But you can find these guys throughout the world and they'll come to you if you don't. Because as soon as you plant something, whether it be a berry bush or a seed in a tilled field, you will then find these critters nearby. So the best ways to protect yourself from them is going to be probably some kind of fence or a pit. Now in the previous video, I showed you how you can make a pit trap around a seeded area. Well, you could do that easily around your entire area, but that's also going to be really annoying with all the water flowing everywhere. So just keep in mind that you can always just put up some fences. If you make some rough hewn fences, it's a relatively simple recipe with just an, some kind of ax, whether it be stone or otherwise, a couple sticks and a couple logs will get you eight rough hewn fences. You can also make some gates as well. The These here, which aren't too much more difficult to make, just a few more logs and you can get a couple of those, but they only open one at a time and they only face in one direction. Uh, later on, once you have access to a saw, you can then start making some of these fancier fences here that can double wide open, uh, making your life a lot easier. But either way, these count as kind of like one and a half block high barriers. Now this isn't going to stop everything. If you have uh, snow in your area in the future, that could pile up and allow creatures in. So perhaps two blocks high is going to be a better idea or having those pit traps around the outside. Either way, you're not going to want to have your soil any closer or your, your hills and stuff like that too close to this because those creatures can do little hops in occasion. And if it's too close to it, then they can easily get up 
onto and into your field and eat all of your crops. I've, I've, I've come back to find my entire field totally destroyed and decimated by nearby rabbits. So you're going to want to make sure that you've got at least two, three blocks of space. Now right here, I think this is a little bit iffy, but eh, either way, it should work. If you're fortunate enough when setting up some kind of perimeter for your farmland, you could potentially trap a fox in there and that will gladly take care of any kind of other pests that get inside. Just don't hit the fox and you should be fine because they're pretty much neutral unless they take damage. So you can keep a pet fox in your area. Something else you're going to watch out for with pests is little areas that they can get through. A full-size rabbit or raccoon might not be able to get through here. I'm not entirely sure, but I know that baby bunnies can. So you're going to want to make sure that you've got things sealed up so that they can't potentially get into these small areas. Another potential pitfall would be that you've got grass growing in your farmland area that you've got fenced off or protected. If it grows to be a little bit too high, like anything taller than a medium grass, or if it is a medium grass on a full-size grass block, then you're going to start spawning rabbits, or at least a chance of them within your farm field. So you're going to want to eliminate these. And just clearing out the grass isn't going to be enough because the grass can grow back. You're going to want to either put down some kind of stones, something in place to keep these, keep the grass at bay from growing in that spot, or just remove it altogether by tilling it. And lastly, one other thing that you're going to want to watch out for is placing things like reed chests or other uh, storables, perhaps half blocks, near a fence. That way animals could actually climb up on top and get over your fences as well. So keep that in mind. That being said, if you still want to be able to traverse your water without actually eliminating it, you can just use some slabs of some sort and you can still traverse over it while keeping the water in the area because water logging is a thing in this game. But you'll notice that I have these in strips of two, depending upon the dirt type, doesn't really matter. I just did this because it's the maximum way that you can get water to your crops. If you have a water block here, the farther away the crop is, the less moisture level it's going to have. In this case, it recently rained, and so I'm getting moisture levels of 100% on some of these blocks. But if it hasn't, then the maximum amount you're going to get is 75% for the it touching or being within one block of a water block. In the next video, I'll be showing you how you can make one of these yourself, but an advanced technique is also to grab a watering can and using it to actually increase the water levels of your blocks individually. As long as you do this once a day in drier or hotter areas, perhaps an area where you don't have water at all in the no neighboring area, you can just keep your uh, moisture levels up and it should be good for whatever you grow. So right now I've got this field. I took a hoe to all of these different soil types and everything is just overgrown with grass as well as horsetail. Yes, this is one way that you can grow horsetail is with fallow fields. That's what these are. Fields that don't have any kind of seeds planted in place. They're just stripped bare and left to go. What happens is they will replenish their own nutrient levels slowly over time to what their maximum level is. At the top tooltip, you'll see nutrient levels, 50% N, 50% P, and 50% K. Growth speeds on this are pretty much close to 100%, and the moisture, because it rained recently, is at 100%, which will slowly reduce over time. Now the N, P, and K stand for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. These are the different nutrient levels that certain seeds will require. And the higher maximum you have, the more that it can replenish and use to grow these things. By looking at something with a high fertility, you can see we jump from 50% to 65%. If we go over to the terra preta that I was mentioning earlier, it's got 80% for its maximum levels. Now, as these get used, your nutrient levels will drop over time because the plant is using it. And it all depends on the plant for what nutrient level will drop. So sometimes leaving your fields empty so that you can grow perhaps healing herbs or just harvest some of the grass that's in that area and allowing the nutrients to replenish is a good idea. Or you rotate your fields. Often people will divide them into like quadrants or sections and then they'll just rotate one field being used and the next one not. So let's go over the types of nutrients. We've got phosphorus over here, which doesn't actually have much to go for. Parsnips and onions. And you'll notice that when I look at these seeds, they have 
heat resistance and cold resistance, as well as how long it takes for these things to grow. It also tells you the required nutrient. As I was saying, P is for phosphorus, and how much consumption it requires when doing this. Onions take 35, where parsnips only take 20, though onions do harvest a little bit sooner and can withstand much more heat than, than parsnips can. So each one's going to have their plus and minus, there are different kinds of uses and so on. Uh, one way of doing it also to have your different uh, nutrient levels grouped by quadrant, and then you can rotate your quadrants so that you're never using the same nutrient. Now in this case, it's only going to use the phosphorus. Same thing with the parsnip. Both of these are only going to do that. Now some more extravagant or exotic ones are going to be peanut seeds. If you notice, it's not very cold resistant at all, and in fact is only good in hot climates. Whereas pumpkins are good for hot and cold areas and are very special with how they're planted. Do not, under any circumstances, plant yours in amongst the rest of your crops. That's going to be a big setback. I will show you how to do pumpkins a little bit later in the video. Moving over to potassium, or K. We've got carrots, flax, and rice. This is going to be <laughs> your meat and potatoes, uh, one might say. Flax seeds are going to be the most important to you in your progression because these will create flax fibers, which you can use to make twine as well as cloth and all sorts of different items that that might entail, which is a huge amount of progress would be missed if you don't start growing flax as soon as possible. Not to mention that you can also eat the grains from it, though it isn't as nutritious as most of the other seeds results. Now if you notice onions, parsnips, and pumpkins, those are all vegetables. Peanuts are protein based. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's pea or anything like that, just each of these might produce a little something different. Like carrots are going to be vegetables, flax and rice are also going to be grains, which you might need in order to balance your diet and encourage a lot more hit points to be on this little red bar down here. Now on the further rare side we've got soybeans, which usually are found in hotter climates, though they're just as hardy as pumpkins, and cassava seeds, which are definitely found in hotter climates and um, require a little bit more effort in order to get those to work, but they can actually come out with more than just one type. They can be a vegetable and they can be a grain result. And then moving on to the last one, nitrogen. We've got spelt, turnip, and rye. Uh, grain, vegetable, and grain. Each of these is going to just be a general good use. They, they're hardy for decent temperatures. You notice that rye is especially good in colder climates, so if you're a little bit further up north, this might be a good way to get some grain in during or close to winter time, dependent upon how cold it may get in your area. At the very least, you can extend your growing season with these. Then you've got in hotter climates, amaranths and sunflower seeds. Both of these are going to be found more commonly down south and are both good for grains. Then you've got some other rare items, cabbage seeds. Uh, cabbages, along with things like pumpkins and perhaps a few others, are going to be loot rewards. You're not really going to find these growing in the wild. So these are really valuable indeed. And you may get more seeds by growing any of these things over time. Cabbages are one of the most saturating vegetables you can possibly eat. Not to mention that you can also grow a fruit. Pineapples can be found as well. This, of course, is going to be in a very hot climate. And then we've got bell peppers. In the current iteration of the game, these will not actually ripen if you do end up finding any. But perhaps someday those will work, and then you'll have another vegetable option in the hotter areas. So now that I've got everything planted up, let's go have a look at temperature. Now, before you probably saw on some of the seeds how they would be affected by different temperature values. If they are too long exposed to temperatures outside of what they claim are good for them, in this case, let's take a look at sunflowers. If it gets too cold, then these are just going to start dying and you might get the seeds back and a little dead shrub will be left in place. Most likely, if you are having problems with winters, you might have better luck with something like a greenhouse. Now there isn't much in the current version of the game that explains about how to create one of these. Just know that you could probably get away with something at least as big as a 7x7. 7 7. 
And with that, you just need to have some kind of glass on the roof. It doesn't have to be the walls. I just did this so that you can see what is going on in here. And it will take some time for it to update. Don't expect this to actually say anything. And it might, it will actually report it for the soil as well as the crop. If you look here, when I, like if I hold my mouse here, it says plus five degrees Celsius from greenhouse. That is when you know that everything is working properly. So you do have to have full blocks in order to use this. You could put your water underneath one of these though. It's most important to get the walls right uh, that are inside the greenhouse and the ceiling. Now I actually did a partial creation and yes doors actually work just fine so feel free to use those but this is the absolute minimum over here and I used quartz glass. Quartz glass is just some clear quartz and some sticks. You might be able to get some of these if you have a high enough level of pick in order to mine out some quartz. Alternately, if you're advanced enough, you can make regular glass, which is a bit clearer and less dirty, but it still works just the same. Neither one of them will have a good or bad result. And you can see that I had some kind of frame here. It doesn't really matter as long as you have the basic walls, ceiling, and of course, you're probably gonna to wanna to have some way of getting into your foods. And leaving the door open won't make a difference. Uh, it's just going to make sure that the animals don't get in. This will still attract rodents like rabbits, so please be aware that that is definitely a thing. And this should extend your growing season as well for another five degrees worth. So you can start a little bit sooner uh, when spring starts coming out, as well as go a little bit later. But as I'm in here, let's take a look at those nutrients. Let's uh, aim a little bit down here, and you can see growth speed 29%. Nitrogen, this is just a regular high fertility farmland, which I will show you about that momentarily. And it says growth speed 29%, moisture 75%, plus five degrees temperature from the greenhouse. And currently the temperature is about 20 degrees. So it's running at about 25 degrees overall in this area. And you can see the nutrient levels are really low. This is why the growth speed has been reduced. Cabbages require a lot because they are big saturators as far as vegetables go. Now again, you can always encourage them to grow a bit more just by using your watering can on these different areas. You can see the growth speed has increased slightly just because the, uh, the moisture level has increased to 100% in this case. Now there are a few ways that you can actually enhance it further. As it is, the nitrogen has run out of that. You can use fertilizers as one option. If you look here, there's bone meal, which can be made by grinding up bones. Grinding things requires a quern, which is not exactly the easiest of things to come to, and you usually will not have access to this to start. You can obtain one of these later on once you have access to a metal pick of some level. Now you can also find some of these sometimes in some different vessels that you might find in the world, but bone meal is probably going to be your most common. If you are killing any of the animals in the world and harvesting the carcasses, you'll get some of these and you can use it to increase your phosphorus on some soil. In this case, we've got some growing onions on this low fertility farmland. Growth speed is at 66%. So if I click this on here, it visibly adds it to the block, and you can start seeing that the slow-release fertilizer will increase by 3% nitrogen and 30% phosphorus. This will slowly, over time, increase the growth potential of this block and the vegetable that is on it. So it's not an instantaneous boom, you've got 30 extra point, you've got 30% more on there. It's a slow release. Now, another one is going to be saltpeter. You can find these on the walls in caves and stuff like that down below in the depths. It's usually a little bit more dangerous to uh, obtain this because you're often in the depths being attacked by all manner of different creatures, but it can increase your potassium levels on plants as well. This being flax requires potassium quite a bit. And if I click on here, it adds that. Yes, if you want, you can actually add these on the same block and double up. But if you look at this, it did increase the nitrogen and the potassium of this block, and it will slow release as well. Now, the next most common is probably going to be compost. This is stuff that you're going to be making in the world. You will have to have access to barrels, and that usually means you'll have to have a saw and access to the metal age. But if you do have access to this, just know that you can get 16 compost from 64 rot. 
What's rot? Well, if you have lots of different kinds of foods and vegetables, fruits, meats, whatever, sitting around not being eaten, it will age over time. In this case, I've got some onions that are fresh for 12.8 days in this basket. At the end of that time, it will start to spoil, and then once that's spoiled, it will then rot. You can take this rot, put it in a barrel, and when you've got a bunch in here, it can will turn into compost after 20 days, which is going to be at least a couple months for the default gaming time, which can be used as a fertilizer in and of itself to increase nitrogen and a little bit of phosphorus and potassium, but it can also be used to make high fertility soil. By taking some compost and a little bit of medium fertility soil, just crafting it in a crafting grid will get you this and it'll have a new increased maximum percentage. So you could feasibly make some high fertility soil then use compost on that soil in order to make it even higher, at least for a short time. This being nitrogen, I'm going to use it on this low fertility one here with the cabbage on it. And you now see it will increase the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. All a certain amount, just a lot more of the nitrogen. And last but not least, potash. This is a legendary fertilizer. It's going to increase your uh, farmland maximum instead of just a temporary benefit like the other ones by 15% each time it's used and completely slow released through every time you do it. But you will need to grind up some sylvite after finding sylvite and that will give you potash. It's possible you could find this as some kind of loot and then when you use it on one of these, you could then increase its potential. For example, this moist farmland here, low fertility, 25% across the board, not the fastest of growers. But if I click on here with it, boom, we've got a slow release fertilizer of 60%. And you notice it just changed what it looks like. It's now considered a medium fertility because its nutrient level maximums are a little bit higher than what they normally would be, or at least they will change over time. And once again, you can combine any of these fertilizers on the same block if desired. It's just potash is the only one that will actually permanently upgrade your soil. All right, so let's do a little bit of a time lapse and see how things progress from here. All right, we've moved forward in time a little bit. It's now September and we can have a look at how things are going. And you probably notice that, well, the barren farmland is not recommended. Uh, yeah, it's it, even the grass is turning brown. Well, that's because the season has changed. But you'll notice that barely anything has grown at all. The growth speed is 10%. So you'd have to have really good circumstances in order to get this to grow to fruition at any point. Going over to the low fertility farmland, you might be lucky during an entire year to get one harvest out of any of these crops. So this is a good reason to show you why you definitely want to have at least medium fertility when planting your crops. Because if you look here, we've got some flax that isn't quite finished. This one here is mature, or at least growth stage eight out of nine over here being nine out of nine. So you could feasibly harvest this and get a little bit from it. And as you can see here, the high fertility easily brought everything to fruition. You might even be able to get a second crop out of it if you start early in the year uh, without any problem. You could even get a second crop out of the medium fertility, depending upon the number of growth stages and the nutrients involved for those as well. Looking at the Terra Preta, you probably noticed it had already finished well before the rest of these already had and it is easily the best farmland to work with if you can find it. How do you find it? Just explore. Look around the world, see if you can find some really dark soil on the sides of any of these ledges, and if so, dig out every last piece you can. Be aware though that even if it's terra preta, high fertility, or any other type, once it's been tilled, if you start digging it back up, you get nothing. It just is destroyed, so there is no easy way of uh, replacing those without getting a new block and retilling it. So once you've picked your farmland spot, you're going to want to make sure that you stick with it, at least for a time. And once you're done, you can just harvest any of these vegetables if they're ripe with your bare hands, or if you really want to go crazy, you could use a knife. I recommend a scythe because it will not just do one block at a time. It will actually do a three by three area around where you stand. 
So feasibly I could stand here and get all of these here, then continue on down and so forth. Now let's give a quick demonstration of how you can use pumpkins. Pumpkin seeds are used very differently from any of the other seeds that you've experienced so far. Yes, they've got eight growth stages, they require some phosphorus, but nothing really as drastically different as the others. This will need a large space. Specifically, you're going to need a 9x9 nine nine area cleared of anything that might obstruct the growth of the plant. And this is just going to be one seed. You'll also want some kind of water source nearby unless you're going to be watering it quite frequently, but this is something that you're also going to want to keep an eye on. Now, it will expand in one of the cardinal directions from the block, whether it be, you know, uh, just any of the flat sides, and it has a 50% chance of growing in any of those directions as it goes. And then, as it progresses, it will eventually grow some pumpkins off of on one of those if you're fortunate enough. One pumpkin can get you one seed. So if you only get one pumpkin from your harvest, be sure to keep at least one from it. Uh, but you can always expand more after that because usually you'll typically get at least a couple if you have a clear area. Now if you have something like grass nearby, don't worry about it. It'll just push the grass out of the way. But if you do have things like walls, steps, fences, uh, or even rabbits nearby, you might then need to worry and clear that space. Now I have put down a bunch of straw, pack dirt, and so on, just so that you can see the levels of how big of a space this is that you're probably going to want to keep clear of any of this. And what I'm going to do is just sit here and we're going to do a bit of a time lapse. And there you go, you can see here that we currently have a lot of pumpkins. And you can tell that the vines are more or less turned a little bit of a dull gray from it. You can check on the center here and it just says withered pumpkin plant. And that's how you know that it's pretty much done with any kind of growth. If you are to try and break the withered pumpkin vine, whether it be barehanded or with a knife, you don't get anything back from it. Even if you break the uh, main pumpkin plant here, this is not where the seeds are going to be. It's going to be the pumpkins themselves. And by cutting them with a knife, bare hand, a hoe, or anything like that, you can just pick these up very easily. And as always, don't forget to craft at least one. I recommend that you craft a couple so that you have some backups because this is not an easy seed to come by, being only a loot reward. But you should be made aware that there's several ways that you can eat this. One is straight up as it is, 480 saturation for one whole pumpkin. Or you can take one of those with a knife and you'll get yourself some pumpkin slices. Now each of these can also be used in cooking recipes and so on, but it's a little bit different way that you can eat 140 at a time. And until you have other means of storage, if you're still using reed chests, I recommend that you bury your reed chest. Reason being, if you look at this, I currently have some onions in here, still good for 1.5 days, if you remember them earlier. By peeking in here, I can open this up. This is still good for 32 days because it's been kept underground in a cellar. All you need are solid blocks around it and it to be a little bit down into the ground. You can go much further down and create a bigger space if you want, no bigger than 7x7x7, seven by seven by seven, but be sure to have any kind of sunlight being blocked as you go. Otherwise, it's going to run into some problems. Just by blocking that up, it already has updated to 48.2 days. This number can change slowly over time depending upon what you have going on. Now there are other ways of doing storage and I'll cover that in a future video, but for now just know that you can bury reed chests in the ground and it should in most cases help lengthen the amount of time that your food lasts, especially during the winter season when you can't grow very much if at all. So once you've harvested your crops and you've got your new foods, obviously you can eat those. Probably in the next video I'll be covering a bunch of cooking. But for now, just know that you can also take all of your flax goodies and put them to good use. In the past I've mentioned how you probably just want to straight up start crafting any fibers into twine and keep twine for whenever you need it, whether you convert it into linen or other useful items. But you can start making something like a simple bow. A little bit of flax twine, some sticks, will get you that. Then you can start making flint arrowheads, sticks, and feathers. Feathers from chickens, flint arrowheads 
from just regular napping with something like flint and combining them together to get you some arrows. This gives you a little bit easier of a ranged weapon attack. Works very good for the hunter class, but a little bit less for something that is reliable on melee attacks like the Blackguard. But there's also new levels of healing. You've got your horsetail poultice, which if you take some linen, which while it's expensive, can be useful later on. And some of those horsetail that you may have gathered from your fallow fields or out in the forests, you can make horsetail poultice to replenish your health at four hit points at a time. There also is a honey sulfur poultice, but that's a little bit more difficult and challenging to come by, especially since it does the most amount of healing you can get. But what I would consider one of the most important advances that you just earned access to, it would be a linen sack. This would be your next upgrade for your backpack system. If you were previously relying on the little hand baskets or your hunter packs, you can then replace those with a linen sack, which is simply made by one flax twine and one linen, Per bag. And just by having one of those equipped, you then gain five inventory slots per bag. So that would give you a total of 20 inventory slots. Not too bad for just a bit of farming, and you can even eat half the profits. And with that, I think we'll finish up this video and move on to the next one. Thank you for tuning in, and if you'd like to see more of this, please be sure to give a like, comment, subscribe, and until next time, folks, I'll see you.